the lack of standardized ultrasound nomenclature to describe the lymph nodes led to the birth of the Vulvar International Tumor Analysis, the Vita Group, in 2016, during the 20th World Congress on Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology in Rome, as a multidisciplinary group with expertise in gynecologic cancer. This established collaborative group have agreed on terminology, definition and measurement technique to describe the inguinal lymph node, as published in Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology Journal. The aim of the consensus was providing nomenclature to describe lymph nodes in the staging of vulvan cancer and other malignancies. The proposed terminology describes peripheral inguinal lymph node, but it can be used for all the other lymph nodes that can be sites of lymphatic spread from malignancies. They include peripheral lymph nodes, such as suprediaphragmatic, supraclavicular and axillary lymph nodes, and non-peripheral abdominal and pelvic nodes. Among them, the parietal ones are located behind the peritoneum, in proximity to larger blood vessels, as paraortic and iliac lymph nodes. The visceral lymph nodes are in the intraperitoneal compartment, in relation to the vessel of the visceral organ, such as celiac trunk, mesenteric and hypogastric vessels in the pelvis. In the VITA consensus, 11 parameters to describe the lymph nodes were identified, involving on grayscale dimensional assessment and morphological assessment, and the color and the power doppler assessment. Now we can go through all of them in details, but before that, just a few hints of lymph node structure to better understand what we will talk about later. The node structure consists of four zones, capsule, cortex, paracortex, and medulla. The capsule is composed of dense connective tissues and surrounds the lymph node. Sometimes it is possible to recognize it on ultrasound as a thin hyperechogenic line. The cortex is the outer area contain mainly B cell organized in lymphoid follicles. On ultrasound it is normally visible as an hyperechogenic homogeneous rima surrounding the hyperechogenic medulla. Paracortex is the region between the medulla and the cortex rich in T cell but on ultrasound it is not possible to distinguish it from the cortex. The medulla corresponds to the inner central region. This contains large blood vessels and lymphatic tissue, including plasma cell and macrophages. On ultrasound, the medulla is usually visible as a central hyperechogenic structure. The ilum is a depression on the side of the lymph node where the blood vessels usually enter and leave, and when the efferent lymphatic vessel leaves the lymph node. On ultrasound, it is recognized as an hyperechogenic indentation in the concave side of the node and appears to be continuous with the medulla. Lymphatic afferent vessels enter through the capsule and open into the subcapsular sinus to the whole cortex. They convert to form larger sinuses into the medulla. Then they become confluent at the hilum and form the efferent vessel. On ultrasound, lymphatic vessels are not recognizable. Arterial and venous vessels usually enter and leave the lymph node at the hilum and are referred as longitudinal ilar vessel, usually, but not always, parallel to the node along axis and then branching into the cortex. They are visible on ultrasound with the color and the power doppler assessment. In some lymph nodes, additional arteries and veins may enter and leave the organ outside the hilum, breaking through the cortex. Starting from a quantitative evaluation, the dimensional assessment is used to define lymph node sites, the shape, and the presence and the uniformity of cortical thickening. The sites of lymph node is defined by three diameters in two orthogonal planes. The examination started from the longitudinal plane, where the longest nodal diameter is seen, and the perpendicular short axis is at its, its maximum. On this plane, the miserable diameters are length and depth. The length represents the longest diameter of the lymph node in any plane.
The depth is the maximum diameter of the lymph node perpendicular to its long axis, as can be seen in the picture. Rotating the probe 90 degrees clockwise, the plane transverse to the lymph node is obtained. Here, the transverse diameter can be seen, but however, it is not routinely measured. The node shape can be defined from a quantitative point of view using the long-short axis ratio, also called length-depth ratio. Traditionally, an oval or elliptical shape corresponds to a long axis at least two times greater than the short diameter, while a round lymph nodes have LS ratio minor than two, as demonstrated in the picture on the right. The diffuse cortical thickening is defined by the ratio between the cortical thickness and the medullar thickness. Thus, it is necessary to have a medulla as a reference structure. In this case, the measurements are taken at the widest point of the cortical thickening, obtained scrolling the lymph node. The thickness of the cortex is measured on both sides of the medulla on the same axis, perpendicular to the longer one from the outer contour to the corticomedullary interface. The medulla is measured on the same axis of C1 and C2. Absence of cortical thickening is defined when cortex is thinner than medulla, with ratio minor than 1. On the contrary, cortical thickening is present when the cortex is equal to or wider than the medulla. Since the presence of corsine is necessary for the measurements and the definition of the cortical thickening, in this case of lymph node with the fibrotic changes, the medulla is absent, thus you cannot assess the cortical thickening. In case in which the cortical thickness to medullar thickness ratio does not involve the maximum cortical thickening, the ratio could not be applied. For instance, in this lymph node with the clear focal thickening, the cortical thickness to medullar thickness ratio is minor than 1, making us consider the lymph node as not thickened. So here, the cortical thickness to medullar thickness ratio cannot be applied. In this case, instead of the ratio, we should pay attention to the maximum cortical thickening, the C-max, that is measured from the cortical medullary interface perpendicular to the nodal outer contour. The cutoff of C-max, which may be predictive for metastatic lymph nodes, needs to be defined in the future. Subsequently, the uniformity of cortical thickening can be assessed through the ratio between the maximum and the minimum cortical thickening, the so-called C-max-C-min ratio, helping the lymph node along its long axis. The measurements are taken on the same plane for the cortical thickening assessment, perpendicular to the surface of the nodal outer contour, from the capsule to the corticomedullary interface. The measurement must be repeated also on the other half of the lymph node. Uniform cortical thickening is defined as C-max C-min minor than 2 on both sides, as can be seen in the left lymph node. The other one represents the case of non-uniform cortical thickening with the C-max C-min ratio equal to or greater than 2, at least on one side of the lymph node. Lymph nodes can be evaluated also by morphological assessment, considering eight parameters. The nodal shape is a subjective assessment of the lymph node contour. It can be regular, involving oval or round shape, or irregular, that can be lobulated or speculated. Over lymph node has long axis greater than the short one, while they are similar in round node. Lobulated shape is defined by the presence of smooth and wavy external contour, while speculated lymph node has spiky blurred margin. In the first two videos, two regular lymph nodes can be seen, one oval and one round. In the lobulated lymph node, the cortex has several bulges and smooth outlines. The last one is an irregular speculated node with blurred edges. 
please consider that the two regular lymph nodes are completely benign, with reactive process. The lobulated lymph node is the result of reactive and post-reactive changes. Finally, the speculated shape is typical of metastatic involvement, as you can see in this complete infiltrated lymph node from vulvan cancer. In the definition of the shape, it is important to consider the lymph node in all its global appearance, rather than focus on irrelevant changes. So you should consider this one as an oval lymph node without lobulated or speculated contour. The nodal core sign is the functional unit formed by the nodal ilum and the medulla. The nodal core sign can be absent or present. It is absent when neither ilum nor medulla are present. On the contrary, when it is present, at least the medulla is visible. It can be defined as complete if the hyperechogenic ilum and the medulla are both visible and partial if only the medulla but not the hilum is detectable. In the video above, you cannot detect the hilum and the medulla, so the nodal core sign is defined as absent. Below, on the left, you can clearly see the complete hyperechogenic medulla and hilum, so the nodal core sign is present and complete. In the lymph node on the right, the hilum cannot be seen, but you can recognize the medulla, thus the nodal core sign is present and partial. Please note that the loss of normal architecture in this lymph node is the result of complete metastatic involvement from vulvan cancer. On the contrary, the two lymph nodes with the present nodal core sign are normal. In particular on the right, the thickening of the epigogenic cortex due to reactive process has compressed the ilum, generating this partial nodal core sign. Sometimes the identification of the nodal core sign can be challenging. In these cases, the color assessment can be helpful. For instance, here, longitudinal ilar vessels can guide you to the potential place of the nodal core sign, as you can see in the dot marked circle around the medulla. Please consider that also the peripheral displacement of the nodal core sign is regarded as nodal core sign being present. Here, in the dot line, you can see the medulla that is displaced at the periphery due to large intranodal metastatic lesion from vulvan cancer. Besides, even when the hyperechogenic nodal core sign is absent, the ilar vascular flow may be detected, as you can see in this reactive lymph node. According to a subjective assessment, the type of cortical thickening can be defined. First of all, the cortical thickening can be classified based on its extension. When it involves less than 50% of the nodal circumference, it is defined focal, as it is clear in this schematic lymph node. Otherwise, it is considered diffuse. It can be either concentric, when the nodal core sign is centrally placed, or eccentric, when the cortex creates convex indentation into the medulla that is displaced towards the periphery. We always have to remember that diffuse cortical thickening, according to the dimensional assessment, can be uniform or not uniform. Please consider that cortical thickening can be assessed only if nodal core sign is present. Thus, in this completely infiltrated lymph node from large B-cell lymphoma, the medulla and the hilum are not visible, so the cortical thickening is defined as not accessible. Here you can see in yellow a representation of a focal cortical thickening with a focal bulging, while the medulla is identified by the asterisk. The rest of the cortex is thin. Below you can recognize the residual lymphatic tissue at the periphery thanks to the asterisk in this eccentric, non-uniform thickened lymph node. In the concentric one on the right, the nodal core sign is in a central position, again with the asterisk, and the cortical thicken is colored yellow. Please note that this focal thickening is in a partially infiltrated lymph node due to an intranodal metastatic lesion from high-grade serous tubal cancer. 
In the eccentric lymph node, tumor deposit in the cortex from high grade serous ovarian cancer created this convex inward indentation and pushed the medulla into the periphery. The appearance of this lymph node is due to inflamed process. The nodal ecogenicity refers to the sonographic appearance of the lymph node compared with the surrounding tissue. In particular, it interests the ecogenicity of the cortex if the nodal corsine is present, or of the whole lymph node if the nodal corsine is absent. The nodal ecogenicity can be homogeneous or non-homogeneous. For non-homogeneous lymph nodes, focal changes can be due to cystic areas and hyperecogenic deposit due to macrocalcification. The diffuse changes involve the sand pattern with increased ecogenicity due to multiple tiny hyperecogenic spots in the whole lymph node, and the reticulation pattern with a characteristic microcystic like aspect. Please consider that in metastatic lymph node we can find also a combination of more than one non homogeneous patterns. In the video clip on the left, you can see lymph node with an homogeneous hyperecogenic cortex. In the upper central part, the lymph node is full of this scattered hyperecogenic deposit. Below, the central part of the lymph node is occupied by a large anechoic cystic area. On the right, you can see a non homogeneous diffuse sand pattern. Multiple tiny hyperecogenic spots are spread all over the node, exactly as small grains of sand. This aspect may be related to the presence of microcalcification or small deposits of other components. Below, non homogeneous diffuse reticulation. Here, the contrast between the apical cortex and the bright septum make the impression of small cystic areas and produce this diffuse microcystic like appearance. While the homogeneous lymph node in this clip is a complete benign lymph node, Please remember that hyperechoic deposits are often present in metastatic lymph nodes from serous ovarian cancer, usually in low grade, but this is a case where the hyperechoic deposits were even found in high grade serous ovarian cancer. Cystic areas are related to necrotic process and malignant infiltration, as in this metastatic lymph node from high grade serous tubal cancer. The sand pattern can be found, for instance, in papillary cancer, and this is a case of a metastatic lymph node from thyroid gland cancer. Please pay attention to the singular aspect of this lymph node in a patient with a chronic lymphatic leukemia. The reticulation pattern is clearly visible, but you can see that the medulla is very tiny and compressed by the complete infiltrated cortex. This is defined as lit sign and is characteristic of hemato-oncological malignant disease. Where specific pattern is not possible to determine, the sonographic appearance is described as non-homogeneous indeterminate. For instance, in this lymph node, the cogenicity is non-homogeneous, but the predominant pattern is not clear. Cystic area can be glimpsed, but not clearly recognizable. Similarly, hyperechoic areas are present in the round part of the lymph node, but both can be artifact as well. So, we define it as non-homogeneous indeterminate. In this other infiltrated lymph node from low-grade sarcoma, you can define the cogenicity as non-homogeneous, but you cannot easily decide the predominant pattern. So, again, we define it as non-homogeneous indeterminate. To define ecogenicity, it could be useful to observe the posterior changes. Here you can see the acoustic shadow below calcification of this metastatic lymph node from low grade serous ovarian cancer. On the right, posterior enhancement is the result of the presence of necrotic cystic areas due to infiltration from high grade serous ovarian cancer. In some cases, just looking on the grid scale, the discrimination between completely non-homogeneous node and not clearly visible medulla can be demanding. For instance, here it is very difficult to decide if the nodal corsine is present or if it is absent with non-homogeneous structure of the node. However, switching on the color Doppler, we can identify the ilar vessel and they can guide us to pay attention to the center of the lymph node, where the partial nodal corsine is present, 
as remarked by the dotted circle. The capsular interruption is seen as a blur interrupted interface between the lymph node and the perinodal tissue. It should be reported as present or absent. On the left, in a metastatic lymph node from carcinosarcoma, the borders are blurred and irregular, and the capsule is interrupted due to projection into the perinodal fat tissue. On the other side, in a normal lymph node, the surrounding capsule is smooth and clearly separated from the perinodal tissue. Corticomedullary interface distortion is defined as the lack of smooth and regular borders between cortex and medulla. It can be present or absent. Here, the corticomedullary interface is clearly distorted in a metastatic lymph node of patients with vulvar cancer. On the right, a reactive lymph node with smooth border between medulla and cortex is seen. Please do not forget that the corticomedullary interface distortion cannot be assessed if the nodal core sign is absent. Thus, in this lymph node without the nodal core sign due to infiltration of high-grade serous ovarian cancer, the corticomedullary interface distortion is not assessable. A hyperechogenic ring is defined as a complete blurred thick halo around the lymph node. It is caused by the desmoplastic perinodal tissue reaction around an infiltrated lymph node. It should be reported as being either present or absent. In the videos on the left from a vulvar cancer patient, a complete hyperechogenic halo with blur underlying tissue around the lymph node is visible while more distantly, perinodal tissue has normal appearance. On the right, you can see a normal lymph node surrounded by sharply demarcated hyperechogenic septa. To describe the perinodal hyperechogenic ring in static images or in clips, sufficient perinodal tissue must be viewable. So, in this clip with a metastatic lymph node from vulvar cancer, the eye magnification of the images prevents you from evaluating the perinodal ring that is defined not accessible. Please note that in the assessment of perinodal hyperechoic ring, some confounding factors can hinder the sonographer. The ring, to be defined as such, must be complete. Thus, the hyperechogenic lymph node capsule the acoustic enhancement behind the lymph node and the hyperechogenic superficial and deep fascia should not be regarded as a perinodal hyperechoic ring. Moreover, in the perinodal ring thickness, the sharply demarcated tiny hyperechogenic septa of the normal perinodal soft tissue are not longer identifiable. In this first example, the reactive lymph node is seen surrounded by a thin hyperechogenic line corresponding to the capsule, not to the hyperechoic perinodal ring that is in general thickened and complete. In this other reactive lymph node, the ectopic hilum can be confused with part of the hyperechoic perinodal ring, but it is localized and so different from a complete halo. In this clip, the hyperechoic ring can wrongly be considered as present, but the sharply demarcated tiny hyperechogenic septa are clearly visible around the lymph node, so also in this case the ring is absent. In this post-reactive lymph node, the deep and the superficial fascia can make the impression of a perinodal ring but they create a non-complete contour around the lymph node and the normal structure of perinodal tissue is preserved. In this last example, the acoustic enhancement behind the cystic area can be misleading and make us think that the perinodal ring is present, but to a trained eye, it is clear that, that this is just in correspondence to the posterior wall, while it disappears at the pulse of the lymph node. So, the perinodal ring is not present. Grouping of lymph nodes refers to fusion of individual lymph nodes. It may be absent, present partial, or present complete. Grouping is absent when lymph nodes can be recognized as separate entities. In partial grouping, lymph nodes are joined in cluster or line up, but the individual nodal borders are still identifiable. 
In complete grouping, lymph nodes appear as an ill-defined structure with no preserved lymph node borders due to enlargement of the lymph nodes and extracapsular extension of tumor growth. In the upper video, separate normal lymph nodes are clearly seen. On the left, more lymph nodes are in contact, the bridge is visible, but it is still possible to recognize individual nodes and their borders. On the right, it is not possible to distinguish one lymph node from another. They are matted together as single undefined mass. Please note that these lymph nodes are normal. The partial grouping can be associated with strongly reactive lymph nodes, as in this case, while the complete grouping is usually present in metastatic lymph nodes from several malignancy processes, in this case, from vulvan cancer. Please consider that it is not always easy to decide if a hill defined mass is due to a more lymph nodes matted together or if it is just a single one big lymph node. In these cases, the color Doppler can help us. For example, in this clip with the grouping infiltrated lymph nodes from blood cancer, the two different ILA structures are clearly visible in the dotted circles. To determine these features in video clips or static images, it is necessary to have sufficient perinodal tissue. So, in this clip, the nodal grouping is not accessible because the nodal contour cannot be assessed. The last part of the sonographic evaluation of the lymph node provides the assessment of vascularization. Assessment of lymph node vascularization comprises both description of the architecture of the blood vessel and subjective quantification of the amount of blood flow, the so-called color score. When color or power Doppler ultrasound is used, pulse repetition frequency must be low, between 0.3 to 0.6 kHz. Similarly, the wall filter should be low, between 50 to 100. The gain is increased to the point of this significant color noise and is then slowly reduced until all artifacts disappear. During Doppler examination, pressure should be minimized or ideally completely avoid because blood flow may be reduced or blocked by pressure. The blood vessel architecture is reported in case of visible nodal vessel in its entirety. It can be defined as ILAR when there is a central flow along the ILAR longitudinal vessel, usually, but not always, parallel to the nodal long axis, transcapsular, with vessel penetrating the cortex from outside, or combined, when both ILAR and transcapsular flow are present. On the left, a lymph node with different and afferent vessels entering at the hilum and branching in the medulla towards the periphery is seen. On the right, transcapsular flow with the chaotic uh, circumferential vascularization and perforating vessel invading the cortex is seen. Finally, in this lymph node, you can see the combined flow with transcapsular vascularization in the dotted circle, while the healer flow at the residual peripheral nodal core sign is indicated by the asterisk. Please note that the lymph node with only healer flow is completely benign. While the presence of transcapsular vascularization in transcapsular or combined dominant architecture is explained by neongeogenesis and neovascularization due to metastatic infiltration in these two cases of high grade serous ovarian cancer. Please note that in these two metastatic lymph nodes from vulvan cancer, the vessels are not visible in their entirety and it is not possible to understand their origin. Thus, the vascular dominant architecture is not accessible. Once the architecture of blood vessels has been assessed, the amount of blood flow should be quantified through the color score. The color score is a subjective semi-quantitative assessment of the color content of the lymph node seen on color or power Doppler ultrasound examination. Color score 1 is equivalent of no color and no vascularization. A score of 2 corresponds to scattered color signals. 
A score of 3 is present when the vessels along their entire length can be observed. In color score 4, the color signal and the vascularization are abundant. The video shows an example of color score 1 with no visible intranodal blood flow, so the dominant architecture flow is not accessible. In color score 2, the lymph node has minimal blood flow with scattered vessels, and also in this case, it is not possible to define the region of the vessels. Color score 3 and moderate blood flow with ilar vascularization can be seen. In the last clip, you can see abundant flow as color core 4 in this round lymph node. In our example, you can notice that the lower color score is observed in two metastatic lymph nodes from vulvan cancer. On the contrary, inflammatory process in these two other reactive lymph nodes causes enhancement of the ilar flow with increased perfusion from the ilar towards to the periphery. After the publication of the Vita Consensus, the method and the terminology described need to be validated and standardized. The Vita Interobserver Variability Study will be the first step in the evaluation of the real applicability of the Vita terms. In particular, the aim of this study will be the assessment of the agreement between ultrasound expert and gynecologist on Vita criteria in the sonographic evaluation of lymph nodes. With the final slide, I would like to acknowledge all the members of the Vita Collaborative Group. Thank you for your attention.